This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Gerrig. Brought to you by... Sailing through the heart of historic cities and landscapes on a river, you get close to iconic landmarks, to local life, to cultural treasures. Viking River Cruises, exploring the world in comfort. Different directions. Twitter is going public. Dell goes private. What it all means. Stopped cold. The S&P's seven-day win streak snapped its longest since July. This as gold suffers its lowest close in a month. And curb appeal. What sells? What doesn't? One home builder is going to extraordinary lengths to figure that out and hoping to gain a competitive edge in the process. We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, September 12th. Good evening, everyone. A big announcement just a short time ago out of Silicon Valley. Twitter filing for an initial public offering. The company filing paperwork with the Securities and Exchange Commission, though it will keep the details of its business secret for now. And, of course, the company told the world by tweeting it. Julia Borston joins us now with more. Julia, it is hard to say this is a surprise. People have been anticipating this for a long time. But now we at least know they're going forward with it. Absolutely. We knew this was coming. We expected this before the end of the year. Now we know that the process is in motion. I think it's fascinating that Twitter announced this news in a tweet. That tweet saying we've confidentially submitted an S-1 filing to the SEC for an IPO. Twitter then adds this tweet does not constitute an offer of any securities for sale. Now, the key thing here is that this is a confidential S-1 filing. Now, Twitter here is making use of the Jobs Act provision that allows companies with less than $1 billion in annual revenue to file confidentially at first. That means that we don't get to read that S-1 filing and see what their revenue is. Then they go back and forth, get comments from the SEC, feedback on things like what risk factors they're disclosing um, in, a, in a quiet period, in a private period of communication between the SEC and Twitter. Then the Twitter will file an official S-1, a public S-1, that we will get to see no later than 21 days before the roadshow begins. But Tyler, I have to say, Twitter did not need to disclose that they were taking this next step. And we are hearing that Goldman Sachs will be the lead banker, and we'll, from, uh, our Kayla Tausche reporting that, and we'll see what other underwriters are named when that official S-1 is filed. Julia, you took us through all of the mechanics, and that all makes a lot of sense, but investors are going to be really excited when this IPO is filed. Do we have any clues from any of the reporting that you've been doing about when this might happen, this year or next year, and maybe even how big it's going to be? Well, you know what, Susie? It all depends on what kind of feedback Twitter gets from the SEC. So um, it, it seems like after Facebook's IPO was such a debacle um, and that first day of trading was so crazy, Twitter will be very careful. Um, it'll be very cautious. And um, right now it's in, in communication with the SEC. And depending on how much feedback it gets, what kind of feedback it gets, that will determine how long it takes before it files that uh, public S-1 and that roadshow begins. So it's too soon to say um, how soon this could happen, but it could be a matter of months before we get that, um, that official public S-1 filing, uh, which of course will be fascinating for us and for everyone to read. And in terms of valuation, um, Twitter was recently valued at about $10 billion when it raised money recently, and we're hearing it could be as much as $15 billion. The valuation could be as high as $15 billion um, when it officially files. All right, Julia, exciting developments. Thank you so much. Julia Borston reporting on Twitter's IPO. Well, from one big company going public to the end of an era and another going private, Dell Computer, one of the leaders of the tech revolution, is going private after shareholders approved a deal by founder Michael Dell. The company, which once boasted a market cap in excess of $100 billion, is being bought out for a fraction of that, about $25 billion. Jackie DeAngelis was at the company headquarters in Texas for the vote and has more on Dell's past, present, and future. After three failed attempts to approve a proposal from CEO Michael Dell to take the company private in a near $25 billion deal, Dell shareholders, including James Leach, finally voted today. The results are in, in the affirmative. Well, it wasn't any different from what I eventually expected. It's a big move for the struggling PC maker formed by Michael Dell himself in his dorm room at the age of 19. Once hailed as a revolutionary company for its direct sales model, 
Dell eventually topped Fortune magazine's list of America's most admired companies, but now is going private in hopes of turning itself around. But inside the meeting room today, shareholders had mixed feelings. Some were relieved, concerned that Dell's stock price could have faltered more amidst the uncertainty. Others worried that $13.75 a share undervalues the company and leaves Dell himself the beneficiary of any kind of comeback. I've been a long-term shareholder. The price has been a lot higher, and if I've ridden it down this far, I could go all the way. For those who want to keep the company public, their sentiment echoing the feelings of activist investor Carl Icahn, who has opposed the deal, even trying to fight it in court, before throwing in the towel earlier this week, saying it would almost be impossible to win. We uh, figured that we can't win. It was just uh, too difficult. Shareholders in Icon's camp felt the vote was skewed to Michael Dell's favor when Dell's special committee changed the voting rules after the last meeting, altering the record date and how abstentions would be counted. On a call following today's vote, Michael Dell said he was pleased. This is a great outcome for our customers and our company. And I'm more than excited to move even faster towards our goal of becoming the industry's leading provider of scalable end-to-end -end technology solutions. Well, today's decision is just part of Dell's next chapter. Now it's up to Michael Dell and Silver Lake Partners to not only devise but execute a strategy to turn the struggling PC maker around. And there are a lot of people out there who think it's very doable, and Michael Dell will certainly reap the benefit of that turnaround if it is possible. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. Joining us now to talk more about Dell's next chapter is J.P. Eggers. He's professor of management at New York University's Stern School of Business. Professor Eggers, nice to have you back again. So you just heard Michael Dell saying that this is a great outcome, but what does he have to do to reinvent his company, to, to rejigger it so that it'll be a success as a private company? This is going to require a significant change within the organization. Obviously, the decision to go private is kind of to move away from the eyes of Wall Street, to look at longer-term targets, and to really try and completely reinvent the organization from the ground up. There's really no more money to be made in the PC market, uh, certainly for Dell at this point in time. And so this move to services nine years after IBM sold off its PC division and made the exact same move in many ways uh, will be a very difficult challenge that they're going to have to try and acquire new skills, restructure the organization, and, and build an entirely new system for the firm. Does going private give Dell the best chance of a success at this, at this challenge? And, and secondly, Mr. Dell has basically been there at the helm or closely involved with that company throughout this uh, most recent period. Why should anyone think that he now has the right recipe to fix it? Well, uh, um, as far as why he has the right recipe to fix it, I, you know, whether he certainly was the visionary that started us off in the first place, um, and he's put a lot of his own money on the table in order to try and make this work. Whether we believe that he deserves the chance based on that, um, it's hard to tell. But you know, it's been it's it's a very difficult thing to try and reorganize a, a business that's been so focused on the PC market uh, while it's publicly traded, because trying to really disentangle itself from that space and move into a completely different area is a very difficult thing to do when you're looking at quarterly returns and, and getting pressure from analysts. Moving private gives them a chance to think longer term, to try and build from build again from the ground up this way, um, and it, it it certainly gives them the, the the flexibility and the privacy to try and take take this thing in a new direction. You know, there's this perception that you can be more innovative if you're a private company rather than a public company. We just reported now that uh, Twitter is going to go public, so it makes you wonder: is that really true? Well, so it's it, it's actually there's there's a lot of data to support the idea that uh, companies become less innovative when they when they when they initial when they go IPO when they go public in the in the first place. Um, a lot of the original innovators within the organization tend to leave. They like to be in smaller companies. They can cash out with the stock options that they have. The uh, the pressure to move towards quarterly earnings certainly tends to diminish innovation. Certainly, radical innovation, more incremental things continue to happen. Um, and for the most part, companies that go public then can use that money to acquire innovations in the, in the outside market. There's much less detail to really try and say what happens when a company goes private, whether it gets the same benefit that a small startup does. But certainly the potential is there to focus on longer term gains and to provide the kind of stock option incentives um, should the company later go public or, or get acquired again uh, that, that can actually provide the right incentive for, uh, for, for innovators within the firm to be successful. Is Dell's experience a lesson to other companies? That's question one. And number two, which you just sort of hinted at, do you expect to see Dell go public at some point way down the road? 
Uh, again, I'll go with the second question first. I mean, certainly there's got to be an exit strategy at some point in time. I, I, I would think that the vision would be to reorganize the, organi the organization, take, a, take some time and rebuild what the, uh, the, the, the business model, and then, yes, to try and go public again or, or to be sold off at some point in time. Um, as far as a lesson to organizations, Dell is in many ways just the latest in a very, very long line of uh, one-time leading iconic organizations that has fallen on hard times. You can look at Kodak, you can look at Polaroid, you can look at Blockbuster Video. In many ways, you can look at where Microsoft finds itself at this point in time and feel the exact same way. Mm -hmm. Many companies have been successful for long periods, and that success has actually led to their downfalls in many ways. All right. Certainly a story to be continued. Professor Eggers, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. Uh, J.P. Eggers, he's professor of management at New York University's Stern School of Business. Well, on Wall Street, the big September rally hit the snooze button today. The S&P 500 seven-session win streak was snapped, as we mentioned earlier. And so was the Dow's run of three consecutive triple-digit gains. The Dow ended it with its first loss of the week, despite big stock-moving news from one of its components, Disney. The House of the Mouse announced it will buy back up to $8 billion in shares. That sent Disney stock up more than 2 percent today. Nevertheless, the Dow dropped nearly 26 points to 15,300. The S&P 500 dipped 5.71 to 1683, and the Nasdaq Composite fell 9 to close at 37.15. Price of gold under pressure today, tumbling 33 an ounce to a four-week low as the safe haven run-up in prices appears to be unwinding. The U.S. government posted a narrower budget shortfall in August compared to the same month a year ago. Last month's budget gap of $148 billion is keeping the nation on track to keep this year's budget deficit under $1 trillion for the first time in five years. An encouraging development for Walmart and its plans to open as many as six new stores in the nation's capital. The mayor of D.C. vetoed a bill that would have forced the chain and other big box retailers in the city to pay workers as much as a 50 percent premium over the minimum wage of $8.25 an hour. The bill was approved by Washington's city council two months ago, but today Mayor Vincent Gray called it a job killer. And still ahead on the program, tying CEO pay to company performance. Is it working? That's coming up. But first, how the international markets close today. There has been a big push to tie company performance to CEO pay, and a new study out today takes a look at whether it's working. Mary Thompson joins us now with more on the findings. So, Mary, is it working? Well, you know, it's interesting. This was a survey done for the Wall Street Journal by the pay researcher Equilar, and what it looked at, at is performance-based grants that were made from 2008 to 2010, and it found that in two-thirds of the, um, the grants, the CEO actually met or exceeded expectations. So it looks like boards are getting pay aligned with performance. However, you don't have any benchmark to compare it to. You don't know how a company performed in pay performed in past years using other types of pay. And this for the was a CEO. good year to perform well. The economy was proving, uh, the stock market was booming, easy for CEOs to meet their targets, right? Well, you know, that's part of the issue with performance based pay is because a lot of that is driven by the economy. So some people say you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt when you see them meet or exceed these expectations, as so many of them did. Is pay coming down? <laughs> not really. I mean, pay is, it dipped. That's, we're not saying year, that here. But pay is still pretty significant. And that's, you know, it's still a concern out there. So is this a case where some. the guys who and women who do not exceed the goals mm -hmm. make less, but they're still making a lot? It's, it's not like they're, they're really... They're really, they're really hurting. You know, there's a new term out there called realizable pay. And what it takes into account is if you receive options or performance grants, uh, performance-based stock, they may be valued at different levels during different times, depending on the stock-based performance, the stock's performance. So let's take a look at Larry Ellison. If you added up all the compensation he's been given, let's say over the last couple of years, his compensation would be double what the realized or current market value of that compensation is, in large part because Oracle's stock hasn't performed as well as many had expected. So his options are underwater, and he hasn't met some other performance stock uh, uh, targets. Very interesting study. Mary, thank you very much. Sure. Mary Thompson reporting.
AMR has been cleared for takeoff. A federal bankruptcy judge has okayed plans by the parent of American Airlines to exit bankruptcy protection and go ahead with its plans to merge with U.S. Airways. But there's a hitch. The merger is still contingent on the outcome of the Justice Department's lawsuit to stop the carrier from joining forces with U.S. Airways because it could lead to higher fares and less competition. Well, it's almost check-in time for Hilton Hotels on Wall Street. The giant hotel operator, which is owned by private equity firm the Blackstone Group, filed paperwork today to begin selling stock to the public. Hilton plans to use some of the $1 billion it hopes to raise from the stock sale to pay down some debt. Well, we begin market focus tonight with a stock that's experienced some sheer drops this year and did again today. Lululemon cutting its outlook for full-year sales and profits. The Overware retailer says the quarter got off to a weak start because of late deliveries of its fall products and the recall of a signature item. The company is also still looking for a new CEO. Investors didn't seem to care that the company beat earnings estimates. The stock punished today down more than 5% to $65.29. Men's Warehouse also having a tough day. The men's clothing retailer cutting its full-year guidance after missing Wall Street earnings estimates. The company said it was hurt by one-time charges and an early Easter that pushed prom tuxedo rentals earlier than usual. This quarterly release is the first without company founder George Zimmer, who was ousted over the summer. You're not going to like the way the stock looked today. Neither would he. It fell 12 percent to 34.08. The board of Mead Johnson, this is the maker of Enfamil Formula, approving a $500 million stock buyback plan. This is in addition to another buyback program approved back in 2010. The chairman says the move reflects confidence in the company's future. The stock rose a fraction to $74.75. Royal Caribbean is doubling its dividend, coming under pressure from its largest shareholder. The cruise liner increased its quarterly dividend to $0.25, cents, up from $0.12, cents, payable on October 8th. The company will also start holding annual elections for its directors, eliminating staggered terms. The stock rose a bit to $38.95. And a regional banking deal announced today. Umpqua Holdings, Oregon's biggest bank, is paying about $2 billion in stock and cash to buy Sterling Financial. The acquisition doubles Umpqua's size to almost 400 branches. Shares of Umpqua tumbled almost 5 percent to $16.14. Sterling Financial, though, surged nearly 7 percent to $28.40. So what are the risks of having a great idea? Well, one of them is that someone else likes it as much as you do, so they copy it. And that's what's happened to Rainbow Loom, the creator of colorful bracelet-making uh, kits that have become a national hit, including with my little guy. Uh, the company filed a lawsuit against its rival, Zenicon, the maker of Funloom, accusing it of copying its idea, right down to the trademark plastic C-shaped fastener that holds the bracelets together. Joining us now to uh, discuss this story is Sarah Needleman. Uh, she's a small business reporter at The Wall Street Journal who did a fascinating story about Rainbow Loom. I can't get enough of it, uh, Sarah. My son is crazy. I'm wearing them on my wrists here. Wrists here. You got some, too. They are seriously the rage. Now, the crux of this suit boils down to a C-shaped plastic fastener. Somebody can't, fas can't patent the letter C or this fastener, can they? Well, uh, Chun Ng, the creator of Rainbow Loom, did get a patent for the Rainbow Loom kit, which includes the C-clip. Um, the patent covers uh, the crochet-type hook that's used to uh, grab the rubber bands and the loom as well. Uh, but the C-shaped clip was one of the biggest parts of the complaint, so that's what we focus on. I thought what was interesting in your story today about this whole patent battle is that this is a small business. It was a very motivated CEO who came up with this very bright idea. And now he wants to protect his business um, from knockoffs. So how does a small business guy without, you know, a lot of money for lawsuits and legal fees and all that protect their ideas? Well, attorneys typically recommend that an entrepreneur goes and gets a provisional patent. That gives you uh, one year's time to protect your idea. It's a couple hundred dollars. And you spend that one year testing the market to see if your product is really uh, something that could be a, a seller. And if it is, then it's worth the investment to some people to go ahead and apply for uh, a patent, for, which can be several thousand dollars, ten to fifteen thousand dollars, could take two years. But if you're granted it, it's good from the time that you filed for the original provisional 
original patent, so you're protected. For so that the time. Rainbow Loom owner is going after not only the Fun Loom maker, but also Toys R Us, which is the seller of uh, uh, the uh, Fun Loom, and uh, no, at least uh, one <laughs> other manufacturer, Crazy Loom. How many of these looms are being <laughs> sold, and at what price? Uh, and why well, didn't I think of it? <laughs> um, they usually cost about $15 at retail. Uh, ch uh, tuning, the creator of Rainbow Loom, um, is suing both Zenicon, which is the company that makes Fun Loom. It's suing Toys R Us for selling Crazy Loom, which is made by another small company. Well, it seems like the CEO is saying he created this market, everybody's copied him, and he's really um, trying to, you know, put them out of business. Can you really patent a market? I mean, what are the chances that he's going to be successful in this lawsuit? Well, he's not patenting the market. And by the way, he did say he sold more than 1.2 million Rainbow Loom kits. Um, and you can imagine there's many, many more that have been sold uh, under these different brands. Um, but he's patented the kit itself and all the different components of it. Um, and that is really the entrepreneur best protection and you have to be very vigilant and look out there for knockoffs and go after them immediately. I guess the danger in this day and age, Sarah, in part, is that with the speed of manufacturing and the ability to copy things uh, through uh, 3D printers and other means, uh, that you can come to market with a close knockoff very, very quickly and that's one of the dangers here. He's really only been on the market, what, he, he, he quit his job a year ago, or he was a, he was working at Nissan as a crash test guy, and he quit his job a year ago. So is that really the, the, the point here, that you can, you can come out to market with a copycat product or a copy product, though they, of course, would say it's not a copycat, uh, very quickly? You can manufacture a product much faster today than you did just a few years ago, and 3D printing is a big part of it because you can make a mold very quickly from home. They're not as expensive as they used to be, and then you can come up with a exact model that you want, have it send it off to the manufacturer. You can set up an e-commerce site very quickly. You can even sell um, e-commerce through Facebook now. So it's a much quicker process, and those knockoffs or alleged knockoffs can come out very quickly, and you have to pay attention. All right, Sarah, thank you very much. Sarah Needleman, small business reporter at the Wall Street Journal. And coming up, just how far are home builders willing to go to give potential buyers what they want? You might be surprised by the answer, but first, take a look at commodities, treasuries, and currencies. Fewer Americans are defaulting on their home loans. Foreclosures fell to an eight-year low last month, dropping another 8 percent from the month prior. And they're down a staggering 44 percent from August of last year. So what's going on? Realty track credits higher home values, steady job growth, and fewer troubled loans. Well, even with the housing market in recovery mode, some home builders are working with potential buyers to figure out what they really want in a new home. One big builder has even made a sort of test kitchen for housing to see what'll sell. Diane Olick has our story. In a nondescript warehouse by Chicago's O'Hare Airport, Pulte Group is doing what it does best, building homes, or at least frames of homes, complete with cardboard kitchens and paper fireplaces. It's amazing what people know and what they can imagine when they walk into an atmosphere like this. They this really unique market research is the brainchild of Pulte CMO Deborah well, Wall, who for 20 years helped sell areas. cars. I remember watching one of our chief engineers at Toyota who spent a whole year watching how people interact and use their product, their vehicle. And we decided that would be the best thing to do here, have people run through homes, see what they need, how they would interact, where they would go. And then as a team, we started working on how can we actually do this in the home building. You're looking down. That's why they're the running down. focus groups through yes. the homes, yep. literally walking them through and, the floor plans. Uh, you would as a researcher, uh, I need to know how you feel about these two homes. And I want you to be very open and honest with me. I just like the openness of not feeling that foyer when you're walking in the walls. As you walked through the room, you could figure out where your, where your kids would be, where the furniture would be. It really seemed to help out a lot. Pulte will run groups through the models for about a week and then move on to another market. They say they'll get at least five new ideas from each one of these events. One idea that came from a recent group is this kids' work center that's visible from the kitchen. And the idea was so popular, in fact, that within a year, the room became a reality. At a high level, I would say most buyers are much more practical and functional in their purpose, where in the past, 
consumers perhaps were more interested in more is better and they're, they're not as interested in that. Buyers today are looking for larger mudrooms, better organizational space, bigger bathrooms for the kids, and full home automation, where everything from the lights, the locks, the alarm system, heat, and AC can be controlled from your smartphone. We tested, does this really work? Can we do this? And the information is incredibly valuable. Because in today's competitive housing market, knowledge is power, and knowing what the buyers want is just as important as knowing what they do not want. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Chicago. And finally tonight, author J.K. Rowling appears to have a little bit more magic in her. Warner Brothers Studio announced that the author of the wildly popular Harry Potter books has signed a deal to write one more screenplay based on a little-known character from the series. The story will be about Newt Scamander and his book, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. It's one of the textbooks Harry and his friends study at Hogwarts School. The story will start in New York City 70 years before Harry was even born. And Tyler, you know, she's a money machine. Uh, she has sold half a billion books. Eight movies came out of them. Eight billion dollars at the box office. Rides now, it at now the this theme deal. parks and now this deal to uh, continue it. Uh, I've got my rainbow <laughs> rooms. That's what I've got. He loves that. <laughs> anyway, that's Nightly Business Report for us. Um, for more on the business stories that we've covered tonight, go to our website, nbr.com. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great evening, everybody, and we'll see you back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you by Sailing through the heart of historic cities and landscapes on a river, you get close to iconic landmarks, to local life, to cultural treasures. Viking River Cruises, exploring the world in comfort. I'm Susie Garib with a nightly business report news brief. One huge tech company is going public, another going private. Twitter filed paperwork to begin selling stock to the public, and Dell shareholders approved founder Michael Dell's $25 billion offer to take the company private. On Wall Street, the big September rally fizzled today as the Dow's three-day streak of triple-digit gains ended. Those blue chips lost 26 points. The Nasdaq Composite fell nine. The S&P dipped five points. Disney announced it'll buy back up to $8 billion of its own shares. A judge has approved the plan for American Airlines' parent company to exit bankruptcy protection. And home foreclosures fell again in August, down 44 percent from the same month last year. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.